Harry? Yes, Chair. Uh, item 8 and 11 as Chair of Routes to Work. Thank you. Noted. Uh, Andrew, I'd like to declare in respect of items 2 and 3 on the basis of being a substitute uh, for the at the City Deal meeting on occasions and in connection with item 10, Fusion Assets, as being the Vice Chair. Is there any other declarations of interest, colleagues? Alan, Councillor Colin Cameron and Councillor Paul Kelly have put it in the chat. Noted, gentlemen. Thank you. I think they need to say it, though. I think they needed to say it for Alan's, uh, for Andrew's purpose. Yes, please. All members need to articulate their declarations for the purposes of the committee and people watching. Uh -huh. So it's Councillor Colin Cameron and then Councillor Paul Kelly, Alan. Uh, Councillor Colin Cam uh, Cameron and Councillor Paul Kelly. Okay, thank you, uh, convener. I've actually got several I need to declare. Um, I'd like to declare items four, six, and nine in my my role as a uh, board member of the SPT. Item four, I believe, I can take part in because it is uh, not a it's an update, not a decision. Items five and sorry, item six and nine, I would like to be put out because it's a decision on. Um, a decision on a decision making thing for uh, what do you call them? Yes, we've got to decide who's getting the money basically. Um, okay. I am five, I'm declaring on the grounds that I run a photography and videography bu uh, business based out of Lanarkshire, so I'd like to declare and be put out of the meeting for that one as well, please. Um, I, I begin, to, I don't know if you need to call, uh, call them, but if that's your desire, I we will, I'm sure we can accommodate. Yeah, okay. I, I I believe it's appropriate as I have in the past um, bid for work with um, larger filmmaking organisations that might intersect. So I don't I would think it best to declare in case of any future problems. Thank you. Right, noted, Colin. Uh, as for Kelly, Paul. Thanks, thanks Chair. Uh, items two and three, like yourself, as a substitute member of the City Deal uh, Board. Thanks. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Can I Councillor McPake has come in as well. Michael. Thanks, Chair. Uh, item four is remote because uh, SPT is mentioned. So uh, same as calling that one. I don't think I need to leave. Item six, where there's a funding decision to be made. Yes, I'll leave the meeting then. Thank you. Michael, noted. And now, before we proceed, colleagues, is there anybody else would like to add to the plethora of declarations? There's no one else in the chat, Alan. Right, thank you, Olivia. Conv convener, can I just inform, can I just confirm that when members have indicated they'll be leaving the meeting, I'll just place them in the lobby. I won't uh, notify the committee, they'll just, just be placed in the lobby automatically by me. Thank you, Andrew. I know you'll place them in Siberia and you'll rehabilitate them again. Thank you. Uh, could we then proceed to item two and ask Lindsay to get, take us through the salient points, Lindsay Noble? Thank you, convener. Um, there's, there's two um, Ravens Craig infrastructure access reports to say. So that the first report um, gives an update on the approach to the land assembly um, for the delivery of the, the first phase of the works um, with regards to the Ravens Craig South project. Importantly, today we're, we're seeking approval to make a compulsory purchase order to acquire the land and the interests um, to, to deliver the, the, the phase of works that we're, we're looking at it at present. To support this, we're also looking to um, take authority to to the um, head of legal and democratic services um, to take um, the necessary steps to um, make the, the CPO um, prepare all the documentation and um, secure that the CPO from the Scottish ministers invest the land within the council. So the report um, in front of you today sets out the background um, to the project, and, and committee is very familiar. With this particular project and the components um, that that that, that um, contains it within the project, but the focus of the report today um, is for the first and, and the most significant um, part of the project. So that really is the the 1.3 kilometres of dual carriageway um, that links um, Motherwell um, under the West Coast Main Line through into Ravens Craig um, via the the signalised um, roundabout at the top of Airbus Road, where Mill Hill Street. Um, under the West Coast Main Line crossing, 
and connects at the existing roundabout at the Rubber Hall Road um, roundabout um, near the, the Ravens Creek Sports Facility. And all of those components have um, planning consent present. So that was given earlier this year in September. But just for completeness, um, I'm just to kind of cover off the other elements within the project. Um, the, the Ravens Creek Infrastructure Access um, South project also comprises um, the dueling um, of Airbus Road to complete the, the full dueling of, of Airbus Road and the junction improvements at Hamilton Road um, near um, Strathclyde Country Park. Um, those components are subject to a, a separate planning process um, and we'll bring those details back to committee um, in the future alongside the, the kind of approach to procurement um, and seeking approval for any contract award um, in, in the future. So just in terms of looking back what we highlighted at the August committee, um, we highlighted that, that the council has been going through a process of um, voluntary acquisition of land um, to assemble all the land that's required to deliver the, the, the various packages um, within the first part of the RA South project. Um, and Appendix 1 within your papers shows the extent of the land that's required um, to deliver the scheme. And you'll see it is quite extensive because it is a significant infrastructure project. But the benefit we have is that the majority of the land um, that's required is um, currently owned by Ravens Creek Limited. And that's shown in Appendix 3 in the report. And the council has an, an agreement with Ravens Creek Limited um, for the transfer of land um, that's required as part of the scheme. Um, now, the council will take ownership of that only when it's, it's needed. Um, and when we have certainty that the, that the full business case is in place so that we've got the funding um, to, to deliver the scheme. Now, the remainder of the land that, that's required is um, it falls within the, the motherwell side of the, of the project and involves land and buildings. Um, and in terms of progress, the report sets out um, the sort of land and the interest that we've, that we've acquired to date. Um, but just for the benefits of, of committee, that, that we've we've now acquired the, the, the Delburn Trading Park um, and we've reached agreement with the majority of tenants there. We've also acquired um, One Manse Road at um, the top of Windmill Hill Street um, and we're currently in discussion and, and kind of um, engaged in dialogue with the, the remaining tenant at that particular location. And we're also engaged and have an on long, ongoing dialogue with um, a number of other landowners um, and we're making positive progress around um, the, word, the, the land that we need um, to deliver the scheme. So that's all in hand at present in terms of the voluntary acquisition. And is our intention to continue with voluntary acquisition um, as we move forward with the project? However, as mentioned at the, the last committee, um, given the nature of the scheme, it is, um, there is a need to make a, a compulsory purchase order. So Appendix 2 of the report shows the land that, that currently sits within the draft um, compulsory purchase order. And just to note that, 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 that appendix will be reviewed and updated as we acquire the land um, through our voluntary um, negotiations. So the report outlines a need for the scheme, which again, the committee is very familiar with, um, and the approved OBC and the, the statement of reasons, which is an appendix four to the report, provides the justification for the compulsory purchase order. Um, and I think it's quite it's quite an important document for, for councillors to read because it really does clearly set out the need for the project um, and the need for the compulsory purchase order. It is anticipated, given the kind of progress we're making um, around um, the voluntary acquisition, that the CPO will um, really only contain a small amount of land and a small number of interests um, going forward. And again, just to, to kind of clarify that, that, that the, the appendix two and the land that's within that CPO will be reviewed as we move through the, the process. So really, I hope, to, I hope I've kind of given you a brief update on where we are with the land assembly and enough information um, to, to give us approval today to, to make that, that CPO um, and authorise the, the head of legal and democratic services. Um, I'm happy to take any questions. Um, Jonathan Speed is also on the, uh, on the committee today, who's the, the senior project uh, manager for the project. So if there's any detailed questions, we're happy to take those. Lindsay, thank you that. Thank you very much for a comprehensive update. Colleagues, I'll throw it open. Does anyone have any questions? Do you indicate by your silence? Nothing appeared in the chat bar, Olivia. Uh, Sir Damasio is looking to come in. Sir Damasio, Paul. Thanks, Alan. 
Uh, I'd just like to first of all thank uh, Lindsay and the team for all all their work so far and and on, on this project. Uh, I'm delighted to to see that we're we've either secured or have have an agreement or we're certainly in constructive dialogue with most of the, the landowners concerned here. Um, I'm aware we have to obviously start the process in terms of the CPOs and get, get the ball rolling and in the event that that's the road that we need to go, go down with uh, some of them. Um, so, and obviously we've got a deadline of 2025 in terms of the, the city deal funding. Um, just just got a couple of questions in in terms of in terms of the the time scales. Uh, um, so the CPO documentation um, going into the Scottish ministers. First of all, when would we be seeking to actually put that in? Um, you know, just for the benefit of of committee. Um, when would we be actually putting in this paperwork uh, to, to the Scottish ministers? What would the anticipated timescale be uh, for that process? And lastly, at what stage um, in terms of the negotiations uh, and basically acquiring these pieces of land, at what stage, what sort of timescale would we have to then Look at actually implementing the CPO. Right, thank you, Paul. Lindsay, you able to respond? Yeah, what I'll do is actually, if you don't mind, I'll refer that onto Jonathan Speed if, in terms of the detail around that. Um, but certainly, the approach we're taking for the CPO, and you're right, Councillor Dimaggio, is we're sort of taking a belts and braces approach. So everything's in at the moment just to make sure that we're, we're covered and, and that, that kind of is clear um, and that's a transparent approach. But certainly, um, the general timescales for a CPO can, is kind of nine to, to 12 months. And if there is the need for inquiry, that can extend it by a further year. Um, but certainly, on terms of the detail, I'll let Jonathan pick that up if you don't mind. Sure. Yeah. So, Jonathan, welcome. Thanks. I'm um, following today. Hopefully, if we get approval today to make the order, we will be aiming to finalise our documents for the ministers, really by the end of December, to be submitting in early January. Um, and we're at a point, I think, in our negotiations with the private landowners now, where um, I guess we have a sense of of where they're all going and where we think we will constructively conclude within a reasonable time frame. So how we think that with the major landowners that are remaining, we will have concluded those discussions, at least to the point whereby we know if we can reach a deal or not by that time frame. So we are very advanced really with the remaining um, owners. So we're quite comfortable really that we have been doing an awful lot of work, particularly with property um, and our estates colleagues over the last six months. And so we are at a very sort of near stage of really identifying the last ones. Uh, there are a number of owners, um, or rather a number of small parcels within the CPO for which we cannot identify the owners because some have fallen out of old British steel boards and coal board, and it's not quite clear I'm clear where those sit. So there will always be some parts of the land sort of always still left within CPO because there's some unidentified owners that we simply can't trace through all the investigations. So all being well, we would submit our information to the ministers in January next year, and that then really starts the process running. We had previously um, allowed in the programme, because we are aware this is a complex project, we are, I mean, we are moving a lot of obviously a fun functioning businesses and active interest that we, we had, I guess, from a project planning point of view, conservatively assumed that we might need to go to public inquiry to go through this process. So we had assumed that kind of within our programmes and that's really is what's settling some of our procurement timescales for bringing on the works contractors for the project. Um, all being well with both CPO itself and inquiry, we would likely um, be, a, be taking land um, on the Motherwell side under CPO, if it is under CPO, uh, we would take that uh, land in early 2020 three ahead of commencing works on parts of that site during the spring summer 2023. We have an option with the phasing of the works that if we are slightly delayed through inquiry on that by say six months, we can substantially commence large parts of the project inside the Ravens Craig site. So we have the ability, if you like, to flex the phasing of the works on the ground a little bit to kind of to help accommodate sort of delays around the CPO process, because it is, I guess it's one of those processes which, which whilst we can plan for is outside of our control. I try to be told as much as I can, but but that is very much down to ministers and others. And so we have to allow, I guess, a conservative time frame for that. Um, we've not been unduly pessimistic because we think we have a clear and credible case uh, for the CPO that's well documented through planning and other, and other things, and particularly through the funding as well. So we are, I guess, confident that we will secure CPO, um, but have allowed a conservative time frame to do so. 
I think, I mean, you picked, picked up an early point, Lizzie, around the timing of when we take land, say, from Ravis Craig Limited. I think, I think the reason that that, uh, that that land at the moment is still shown within the CPO plans is because we've done a lot of our own investigations on the title of that land. It's made up of a number of smaller parcels of titles. At the, at the moment, as we continue our investigations, we are, I guess, from a legal point of view, we're just trying to make sure that no other odd interest or right or service to transpires, which if we don't include that land now in the CPO, then that could come back to bite us later on. So very much that is a, a belt and braces that sort of approach to that across the whole of the site, um, really, that we're taking at this time frame. Um, in terms of the overall time frame, then to say, um, and an item with the only agenda sort of really starts to pick up the next piece of this, which is the procurement of works contracts. Um, uh, we have now pretty much reached, reached agreement to, this morning, I think, with the last occupier of Dublin Trading Park around the timing on that, which is very positive, and we should be coming to committee to Finance and Resources Committee later this month on that transaction, which is sort of really great news that we've got agreements sort of on a voluntary basis with all of those tenants, which is really important to us. And that will enable us to make sure that we can give the West Coast mainline um, of breach cotton contractors full and unfettered access to that piece of land, which is really positive to get a real milestone in the works underway, not least because the time frame for that construction works is very much fixed by network rails closure of the West Coast Main Line during the spring of 2023, which again is something that we're not able to uh, to affect the timing of that of that plan track closure because that's very much a sort of a network rail, if you like, kind of control process. So um yeah, apologies if that was too much information, Paul. Sorry. Jonathan, thank you for that. Uh, Paul, does that answer your point? Yeah, very thoroughly. Thank you very much. Uh, can, I, I believe it's Councillor Cameron now. Colin. Thank you, uh, thank you convener. Um, yeah, I had a question regarding the CPO uh, issue. Now, it's good to hear you're so confident in getting out, you think you'll get everything resolved. But my question is, what happens if the parts of the CPO fail and do not appear? I only ask this because I know in the past we have had road projects where CPOs etc have been put have been tried put in place and they failed and they've not happened. An example of that is actually at the Motherwell entrance to the Ravenscraig site, where the where the roundabout had to be moved. It's just to find out: do we have a Plan B if such a thing happens again? So I guess. In yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry. I guess in short, the answer is no. Um, I guess our real problem with the city deal program, or I guess it's the opportunity as much as it's the constraint, is the time frame on the funding that's available really runs through to 2025. This that helps us an awful lot in both making the case of the CPO as to why we need to make the intervention at, at this time rather than can I guess wait for an unending period of trying to do this on a voluntary basis. So we do need to run the CPO alongside the voluntary process as Lindsay has set out. Um, but ultimately, we are dependent if we're going to try and achieve that program both for the West Coast Mainline Crossing. Uh, but also for the city deal funding that we are having to advance in the matter of our works and the matter of our procurement and and land assembly activity in advance of having a cpo in place i guess if i had um and this and this sounds facetious but it's not meant to if i had another five years uh, uh, we wouldn't be doing as much in parallel as we are having to do i guess it's it's it it's not an ideal, but I guess I mean from a risk assessment point of view and our project board with the project uh, sponsors and the leader pan, particularly we you know kind of we run through this on a regular basis to understand the risks we're taking. And it is a risk, um, but it is one that we feel in terms of securing the investment, we don't have much of a choice to take, but it is also a comparatively uh, low risk, not least because of the status of Ravens Craig Master Plan as a development within the Scottish government's uh, uh, national planning framework. It is a well-established scheme and a well-established principle for the need for the project since 2005 with the first master plan that included for this road crossing. So it's something that is well-established in kind of principle and policy. Thank you for that, Jonathan. Does that answer your point, Colin? It gives me a straight answer. Thank you very much. Okay. You're welcome. Councillor Hume, Jim. Thanks, Chair. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm just wondering, uh, for the businesses that are being forced to close, uh, what support does the council put in place to to provide them uh, other premises, preferably within the the local area? So in so in terms of the Dublin Trading Park, I'll start with that end. So so on most of the cases, a number have chosen to relocate and find alternative premises. Um, so we've generally been, I guess, running down. Um, uh, there was 11 interests initially plus the servitude across the site and there's a range of length of leases and to different premises some some have responded during the covid time by 
downsizing, I guess, and have taken the opportunity to sort of find other premises that are more suitable. There, there's been two or three from that point of view, and they've been in touch with colleagues from the Ron Weir's team and Enterprise um, and the Business Gateway Services to help do property searches. We've been doing a lot of that work, particularly through the project as well, to help identify alternative places. But also where we are bringing leases to an end early, I mean, we are paying compensation on that basis, which again is helping them both cover costs of relocation to the two other premises, but also, again, is providing some value to the remaining lease that would help them essentially to sort of find another place and come us up and cover some of those initial costs. So it's kind of a mix of property uh, support and project support, as well as the business gateway um, and enterprise uh, team that we've got at the moment. In terms of some of the larger interests, where, where they have land rather than leasehold interests, we are uh, working with a couple at the moment on alternative sites, potentially where we can facilitate that that still very much forms part of a compensation package. And so, um, again, we're working through that at the moment, particularly with the largest landowner there, and we hope to reach a satisfactory conclusion on that in the next sort of month or so, and that is progressing very well. But again, we still need to be able to fall back on, on the CPO if we have to, which is obviously everything that we're trying to avoid, but we do need to have to do that. Yeah. Jim, does that answer your point? Yes, yeah, okay. And I, I just hope that, um... The premises that are relocating are able to relocate locally, that's all. Fair point, Jim, fair point. I understand that. Colleagues, does anyone have any other points? Are we happy to, are we happy to accept the recommendations on page five and proceed? Thank you, colleagues. Can we move on to item four, please? Item three, sorry. Thanks, Lindsay, I'll leave that to you again. Yes, thank you. Um, this gives a, a further update. Um, infrastructure Act for um, South project. It specifically um, focuses on the, the kind of procurement of the first phase of the works. Um, there is a lot of information in this report. It's quite a lengthy report, um, but I think that really illustrates the significant progress that we're making around this particular phase of the of the works, um, and also the current pace. And I think you know the, the kind of comments there by Jonathan did. Um, and kind of cover off some of the kind of constraints that we're working with regards into the city deal um, program and the timelines involved there. Um, so in short, um, and sort of building on the first report, um, the, the committee knows that we're developing um, the RA South project in phases um, with a number of work packages. Um, and the first work package is, is the West Coast Mainline um, crossing. So section two of the, the report sets out the agreed procurement approach. The tender is led by Network Rail. They are using a mini comp um, competition process um, using their existing frameworks. It's ongoing and we're looking for that to conclude in December of this year. The value is kind of estimated at um, 20 million. So we will be looking to come back to committee um, likely in February um, next year. Um, to seek approval to award those works and also to seek approval to um, put in place an agreement with Network Rail to deliver those works. So today we're, we're sort of seeking approval um, to submit the um, full business case for those particular elements of works um, to the Glasgow City Region um, Chief Executives Group. Um, the full business case is in line with the approved OBC and essentially it, it just um, outlines the tender process and the outcome. The second um, ask of committee today is we were seeking approval to commence the procurement um, of, the, the sort of the next phase of works, if you like, the next package of works um, to create the connection between Motherwell and Ravenscreek. So that's that 1.3 kilometres of dual carriageway and the signalised um, roundabout um, and all the other can kind of components um, that support that in terms of active travel and the operational land. The estimated value of those works is in excess of 20 million. So that procurement will be carried out in line with the Scottish procurement regs and in accordance with the Glasgow City Region um, Sustainable Procurement um, Strategy. As noted um, earlier, that the outcome of that will be brought back to committee um, for approval and also will be subject to full business case um, approval. I'm um, looking looking ahead and, and looking forward and again just picking up on the pace of the of the project. Um, today we're looking for agreement to submit the um, full business case again to the Glasgow City Region um, um, Chief Executives Group for those connection works. Um, we're asking for that in, in advance to give um, the Glasgow City Region um, cabinet um, confidence and assurance 
um, and others assurance that we're, we are moving forward with this particular um, scheme and that this visa works. Um, one of the things I sort of picked up is I think it might be valuable, and, and Jonathan and I have discussed it earlier, that we do a more detailed member session, perhaps in a sort of February, March next year, and um, when we have more out, um, more information around the procurement, the outcome of the procurement, and the timelines involved. And um, so I kind of like to offer that um, today, and perhaps we can put that into into place um, next year. So really, that just kind of gives you a flavour of, of what where we are with um, the procurement, and uh, say there's a number of asks in there around the, the full business cases. Um, so I'm happy to take questions and um, follow on that report. Thank you, Lindsay, for that comprehensive update. Uh, colleagues, does anyone have any questions or comments? I'm sorry to ask you. Thank you, Olivia. Paul. Hi, uh, uh, thank you very much again, Lindsay. Um, Obviously, this is part part and parcel of the, the the wider wider project. That I'm just at uh, which um, don't have any any issues with any of it. But I'm just asking for a a reminder for committee, if you like, um, in terms of the funding breakdown. Good. Well, Thank you. Lindsay, are you able to respond? In terms of the separate packages, or in terms of the the Pan Lanarkshire corridor, so just 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 to make that. Yeah, in, in terms of uh, how much of the funding comes from City Deal, uh, what contributions North Lanarkshire Council may have to make, uh, and is it network route rail that's involved, etc. So, so in terms of the 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 Ravens the, the Ravenscray access project, the the bulk of the the, the um. Funding is coming from um, Glasgow City Region, so there's a, a, a variant split between um, the Glasgow City Region funding and NLC funding, and, and, and Council um, will um, remember that there was an additional contribution made by NLC to deliver the, the, the project. Um, what 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 I'd probably prefer to do is probably bring back a report on that to to committee if that if that's possible just in terms of the breakdown um, around the particular elements and, and the commitments within the capital program um, or I can come back to you separately on that Councillor Dimashio. Yeah if you could do both that, that would be appreciated. Absolutely. Yeah happy with that Paul. Yep thank you. Thank you Lindsay. Um Councillor McPake Michael Thanks, Chair. No, it's, it's just really a comment, and you know, to see where we are with this project now. Um, I mean, it's been ongoing and very frustrating in times, but now we're actually beginning to see the meat in the bones, and it's absolutely fantastic to see to see we're talking about forty million pounds of investment into uh, the Ravens Craig and Motherwell in general. So just to thank you yourself, Chair, and the whole team for the hard work that's went on, and I know, I know it's been on for several years, but now we're beginning to see the fruits of our labour. So thanks very much to everyone, thanks. Michael, thank you for your kind words and noted. I'm sure the, the, my colleagues will appreciate those kind words. Um, does anyone have any other points? Happy accepting recommendations on page 39 and move on. Thank you, thank you. Alan, I understand to take us through item four. Yeah, thanks, convener, and uh, afternoon, everyone. Um, so this report is a uh, six monthly report that we, we bring to committee uh, that provides um, an update on the town centre regeneration theme that's within the, the wider economic regeneration delivery plan, the ERDP. So as we've previously discussed and reported at committee, I think there's now a sort of general consensus that a new model is required for our town centres. Um, and, you know, I think all the more so now, uh, post-COVID, in relation to the irreversible decline of um, retail within town centres has been the kind of the dominant uh, use. And we need to look at a, a more mixed use in terms of our, our town centres to make sure that they continue to be uh, attractive and uh, viable places. And particularly in terms of the potential increase of residential provision within our town centres. So as part of that process uh, and to help plan for that uh, major transition, uh, as the committee will be aware, the, the council has developed uh, town visions for each of its um, eight town centres, which are really just concept designs in terms of what the town centres may look like in the, the, the longer term um, and how we then uh, look, look to take that forward. So those um, town visions were approved at Policy and Strategy Committee in September, um, following a, a period of um, stakeholder engagement 
um, on the uh, various uh, visions. So the next step, as outlined in the report, is really to then look at how we take those forward in relation to developing uh, action plans and identifying what the um, investment priorities are uh, within the town centres, because as we've uh, repeatedly said, these are very much long term uh, visions and, and plans. And of course, um, we don't own uh, or the council doesn't uh, have, have a lot of ownership within the town centres. So uh, the delivery of the, the, the town visions will obviously have to be done uh, in partnership with um, private sector and other, uh, other interests. So the plan is, as I said, to start developing uh, town action plans, and that will be done um, through uh, close engagement with the, the community boards, uh, potentially through um, sort of subgroups or, or focus groups uh, linked to the community boards, um, and that will be taken, uh, taken forward shortly. It's also at the same time noted within the report that there are a number of um, active projects uh, on, ongoing uh, within the, the town centres, and these are outlined in Appendix 1. And obviously, these uh, contribute in terms of the, the uh, delivery and the, uh, the aims of the, the town visions. Uh, and we've provided a wee bit of detail on some of those projects um, in Appendix 1. So, happy to take any questions. And David's here as well, um, if there's, there's any questions around the town visions. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Pam. Thank you for the comprehensive update. Colleagues, uh, does anyone have, I see Agnes has a question. Councillor McGowan. Uh, <clears throat> I've said before that I think this is very exciting. I can't wait to see Mother Old Town Centre uh, rejuvenated. Now um, can I, now can I, and uh, Cumbernauld as well. <laughs> I, do, I think it's very, very exciting. And the change of use, you know, to you know, a variety of uses in town centres is greatly needed. Uh, I've said before, but I can't wait to see the town hall and the YMCA rejuvenated both beautiful buildings, and I'm glad that they are being kept. Uh, the question I want to ask is just about Motherwell Library. I'm also delighted that uh, it's being retained and uh, it's been the fabric has been uh, done up. But, you know, it says that the works and site have recently been com completed but um, there's still rewiring going on, I think, inside. Maybe you're just talking about the outside that's been completed because uh, of a lot of groups of ladies who are bemoaning the fact that they can't get their knitting groups in and their reading groups and all the groups that they used to have in Mother Library. And they've been told that it'll be about February before the rewiring's finished. So I presume you're just talking about the outside fabric when you say that it's completed, but there seems to be other bits and pieces going on. Yeah. yeah, thanks, Councillor McGowan. Yes, um, just to, I suppose to be clear that the, um, in terms of the, the funding um, that the, we brought to the, the party, if you like, um, that was um, towards, as you say, the external sort of fabric improvements. Um, and obviously, the, uh, the Council's also funded um, the, uh, the other works that, that you refer to. So um, I think the, uh, the reference, as you say, is, is about the external works. but. Um, I think uh, hopefully I'd agree. You know, it's, it's, uh, the building is looking great, and as you say, uh, hopefully these other works will also um, en enhance uh, you know the experience for for people using it, uh, and indeed we're also um, working with um, colleagues about potentially other future uh, opportunities for for development as well. So uh, we'll continue to to work closely with other other colleagues for if there's other uh, potential opportunities that that might arise. Thanks. Agnes, does that answer your point? Thank you. Councillor Demarcio, Paul. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, first of all, I'd just like to, to thank the team for all their work and the, the ongoing projects and delighted to see the, the number of uh, projects um, you know, coming through uh, constantly, if you like. In terms of the 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 town vision action plan um and the establishing establishing of uh, subgroups etc can i just ask for committee's benefit how how you envisage um that operating uh, within the, the the community board setting and how, how that feeds feeds in uh will feed into to the, the town visions as are developed and and lastly other than than that engagement, is there any other 
engagement. I know we've had engagement already. Uh, is there any other forms of engagement planned? Thanks, Paul. Well, I mean, I can maybe bring David in a minute as, uh, just to give a bit more detail on, on that. But and at, at, at the end of the day, um, you know, that will be up to the, the, I suppose, the community boards and the community reps themselves in terms of how they want to uh, engage. And I think um, David will maybe comment that there's obviously, um, had, we've already, um, I suppose, had made the offer and started the process um, about um, potentially establishing subgroups for, for the, within each of the community boards. So. Um, that will probably develop, it, uh, as I say, depending on how the community boards themselves want to take uh, to take that forward. And I think that's why we've said it might be subgroups, it might be focus groups. So you know, it may, may be uh, coming in, in uh, different shapes and sizes. But David, do you want to add to that? Thanks. Yeah, just uh, a couple of things. So in terms of the town visions, I think you know we've got almost within each of our kind of towns a hierarchy in terms of you know what we're wanting to you know focus on so if you're taking airdrie for example you know we want to focus you know the the retail you know around the the cross you know and then when we're moving you know south bridge street into residential de development uh, for example just because of the quality of the offer there so we've got a number of um, points that we're wanting to take forward i think what we're proposing to do in the first case is to go to the community boards I and mean, I expect to be attending them within the next round to talk about the town visions and to talk about the, the process and doing that once we've agreed those kind of priorities then what we will probably be looking for within our each of our towns is almost zonal kind of action plans you know of, of, of how we, we take that forward now I have to say you know to a certain extent some of this we probably can share with community boards or subgroup because there'll be commercial sensitivities you know behind this you know again if we're going to look and you know target some you know areas of retail you know to 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 do that kind of change excuse me david david could you try and speak up a bit more and i've just had a comment and someone's struggling to hear a bit is there any possibility that can be done at your end or um i can shout <laughs> by all means david the floor's yours no, I think you know we're we we're going to be focused um, on stuff that might not be it, able to be taken forward by the community board because there'll be commercial sensitivity, you know, behind it. But what we will also be doing is, you know, this doesn't preclude the planning process and it doesn't preclude our other consultation process. So if we have you know large projects that we want to take forward, you know, we'll still be doing you know engagement with communities will still be engaging through the planning process and so forth so it's a whole mixture of the consultation thank you david paul does that answer your point yeah i i, I, I was struggling to hear but I, I did i think i picked up uh, on the main point so no thanks thank you for that the colleagues does anyone have any other comments no, all I'll say at this juncture, folks, in the words of former President Obama, the future rewards those who press on, and we certainly shall. Thank you, colleagues. Can I, that brings us then to item five. And could ask Pam again, please? Yeah, um, so something completely different then. Um, so that, that's the port um, looking for approval for a new film charter and code of conduct to really help support and encourage the requests that we get from production companies to film in North Lanarkshire. Uh, and that includes filming within uh, council premises and, and buildings um, uh, that, that uh, the council or NLP might, might own. The council uh, set out in the report um, provides a, a one-stop shop approach for film production companies. Uh, so there's one point of contact and that's within the, the enterprise team. Um, and they really provide um, you know, advice and guidance uh, and, and help liaise with uh, other council services and agencies uh, in terms of um, all of the different uh, inputs that, that might be required. As uh, set out in the report, and people will be aware, the film and TV sector is an increasingly um, important part of the local economy, and, and North Lanarkshire is a particularly attractive area, um, obviously in terms of its location and the, the variety of uh, locations it offers as well and, and uh, other uh, attractions that North Lanarkshire um, offers. So um, we've seen an increase, uh, particularly recently, in terms of uh, inquiries for from film production companies to, to, to film here. So um, it's now the appropriate time, we think, to further develop and formalise 
um, the way that we engage with the the, 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 the film sector, um, and that's through we think that the, the development of the um, the film charter, which obviously set, in effect sets out our stall and what, what we can offer, and also through the, the code of conduct, which um, on the other hand is what uh, I suppose outlines the expectations um, and, and gives guidance uh, to uh, production companies in terms of what uh, really is expected um, from them. Uh, at the same time, the enterprise team are also looking at um, maximising all opportunities in terms of uh, for the local economy um, and to, to, uh, for local supply chains um, and for any other employment opportunities. And that, that work is obviously ongoing. So um, I'm pleased to say that, that Fiona uh, Wilson, who is the, the film liaison officer, is uh, also attending committee. So um, she'll be pleased to answer uh, any questions um, that anybody has on uh, on either the, the charter or the, the code of conduct or, or the report itself. Thanks. Thanks, Pam. Any comments, colleagues? Silence means acceptance. Shona, thank you. Excellent piece of work. Excellent piece of work. How uh, timely with Leonard DiCaprio in town, eh? So, uh, <laughs> well done, Shona. Keep up the good thank work. You. Thank you. Much appreciated you. from all. Colleagues, I assume we're accepting the recommendations of page 53. Thank you. Can we move on to item six, please, Pam, which I believe is you again? Yeah, thanks, uh, convener. Um, so this report, which again, we we, we, we bring to committee on a, a fairly regular basis, uh, really provides a, an update and an overview of um, the number, quite a, a big number now of external funding streams that the council obviously uh, aims to maximise uh, in terms of helping deliver both on our ERDT uh, priorities, um, some of which we've already discussed, and also the council's wider ambition programme. The, the report, although it's uh, mainly for noting, it's also seeking um, approval for this um, potential submission of bids for the next round of the, the levelling up fund um, as well, I, which I'll, I'll mention in a minute. So uh, I, I wouldn't propose to go through the, the report. You'd be glad to know in, uh, in detail that there is uh, hopefully a lot of information there that is, um, is useful for, for members um, and we're happy to take questions on it. But just a, a couple of points um, maybe to, to highlight, um, first of all. So in terms of the, the levelling up fund, um, the committee will recall, I think in, it was May, uh, that um, we, we reported on, on the levelling up fund and it was agreed to submit uh, one bid to the first round, which was back in June. We had a very short time time scale to do that. Um, one bid to the uh, to round one um, linked to the Cumbernauld Town Sector uh, regeneration. Um, we just heard last week that the, that, that submission was um, unsuccessful. We don't have feedback yet as to the reasons why. So obviously we'll, we'll await that or we're seeking that um, and we may uh, decide um, if appropriate to, to resubmit um, in some form uh, for a, a future in um, the next round of the, the levelling up fund, which we believe or uh, the indication is that that will be um, in, in spring, uh, next spring. So we're proposing, um, as as outlined in uh, two point one point three of the report, we propose to um, develop obviously further bids um, for for the levelling up fund, as we've previously in indicated. Um, one bid per UK constituency can be submitted. So it's proposed to focus um, the bids uh, around um, Ravenscraig in terms of uh, remediation enabling. Works to facilitate um, a mixed uh, mixed use development in, in Ravenscraig. Um, looking at, uh, as we've mentioned uh, in previous report, around um, bringing residential into town centres. Uh, so a, a bid that would be linked to some of their heritage buildings and and uh, other empty um, buildings in Airdrie town centre to to look to bring bring them back into use as residential, uh, and um, quite an, uh, and also an exciting development looking to um, enhance and develop the, the Summer Lee Heritage Centre as a, a premier um, tourist and, and um, visitor attraction and also wider um, in terms of the wider area around the Summer Lee um, Town Centre, the Canal Basin and the, the, the entrance to, to Cope Bridge. So um, these are the, the sort of three areas that we're, we're focusing on and proposed to um, develop the bids for. Also, just to highlight um, the, the Scottish Government's place-based investment programme. 
Uh, and again, we've reported on, on this, I think, but this, this is £275 million um, that the, the Scottish Government's identified to support place-based uh, programmes, uh, and that includes uh, town centre and community-led uh, regeneration initiatives. So it also incorporates the Regeneration Capital Grant Fund um, that we've, we've um, also uh, bid for and, and the report uh, outlined the, um, the update on that as well. So the Council's been allocated uh, £2.8 million pound for 21-22. We expect that we'll get um, similar type allocations for, for future years, but that's not been uh, confirmed yet. Uh, the, the funding has to be spent or legally uh, committed uh, within the financial year. Um, so the projects that it's supposed to take for or are, that's been taken forward on that basis um, are set out in uh, Appendix 1. And we're also uh, developing a pipeline uh, to make sure that, as I say, we, we maximise uh, any investment opportunities, um, including the, the place-based investment programme uh, that's available to us. So I think that that's I say there's, there's other detail in, in the report around the uh, vacant public land fund, which we knew obviously the um, report to committee on a regular basis in terms of the, the proposals for, for the use of the, the allocation that we get, which is just under £2 million for the current year. And 2.3.2 of the report obviously highlights again um, the, the projects that are uh, being funded mainly through um, fusion assets uh, in relation to. Um, some of the developments out both at Ravens Creek and uh, Gart Cove, and also funding for the Ravens Creek Active Travel uh, route as well. The other um, funding source that's new is the, the Green Growth Accelerator, uh, and I'll definitely be asking David to explain this one. It's a bit more, uh, a bit, bit different because it, it, although it's funding um, up front, it, is, um, it then get, does get, get repaid, which I think is linked to uh, the uh, carbon uh, reduction targets. So. A wee, wee bit more complicated, but again, a, re, a really good opportunity there to link this to the plan for the, the master plan um, for Strathclyde um, Park uh, and to make that a sort of a low, low carbon sort of um, hub. And some of the initiatives that are set out in the report are quite uh, uh, quite exciting. So we've been successful in getting £120,000 for to develop the feasibility. So obviously, it doesn't commit us to. Uh, to anything at this stage, but um, it, it means that we're one of the pathfinders uh, to, to look at um, potentially uh, submitting and, and uh, securing funding from the Green Growth Accelerator. So uh, that's a, a kind of very brief and quick overview, uh, convener, but um, David or, or myself, happy to take uh, any questions on that. Thank you, Pam. Um, Council Len, Greg, I believe you've got a question. I think Councillor Lennon has literally just started experiencing connectivity problems, Alan. I don't know if you want to take Councillor Damasio first and then see if Greg comes back. Good suggestion, yeah, Olivia. Councillor Damasio, Paul. Thank you, Chair. Um, and, and thank you, Pamela, for, for the update, this report and all, all the, the work that you're doing. Again, you and the team in this area. Um, sure. In terms of the Level, leveling up fund fund. Um, my understanding is there has to be, as we're all aware, that the funding's coming direct from Westminster, uh, and as opposed to uh, through through the Scottish government. So, but I'm I'm aware that one of the caveats is that the oh, sorry, my understanding is that the the Westminster representative the MP has to support the bid. So. I'm, I'm, that, that was understanding that I had. Uh, maybe clarify that and uh, uh, update us on any sort of engagement that we've had with um, MPs, uh, obviously specifically in this case, and local members. And, and if we could consider uh, some either engagement or updates, certainly uh, for local members, uh, you know, councillors included. Yeah. Yeah, ha happy to do that. Um, yeah, just so uh, obviously it's not a requirement that the MP um, provides uh, support, but it is obviously beneficial and it is part of the uh, the, ass the assessment process. So um, we would be seeking um, that endorsement from um, from the MP uh, or the MPs rather for for each uh, the bids and indeed. Uh, we we got that endorsement for the um, 
for the bid for Cumbernauld from the local MP. So yeah, and we're happy to give the the commitment um, that we will engage with uh, the members um, and of of course um, the the MP um, at, for each of these areas that we've we've outlined. I said we're still uh, at relatively um, early stages um, in, in terms of some of them. But, uh, and obviously there's some some sensitivity, commercial sensitivity again uh, in set, certain areas. But uh, yes, we, we have had some engagement with um, the local MP um, from Motherwell, but we we will uh, that will be part of the process be before we finalise and submit um, bids, and we will be seeking that that endorsement for for each of the bids. Uh, Paul, okay. does that answer your point? It does. I've just got another quick question, if that's okay, Alan. Okay. Uh, just on the the is it place based investment program, the Kenley Parish Church Community Hub project. I was just to inquire as to whether you had, there was feedback as to why that wasn't successful. David, can you maybe clarify that? Thanks. So I think the, when they came back, I think their focus was well, the, the Scottish government thought their focus was more about the building itself rather than about the, the communities and growing the community and, and so forth. It's just the way it is. It's, 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 it's a really, really type of fund that it's, you're never quite sure what you're going to get you know, from it. Or you can put a very similar bid in you know, and it scores really well and you, know, you get the funding and you seem to almost replicate that someplace else and, and don't get the funding for it. So. Um, but definitely, their focus, their 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 thoughts with the focus was more on the buildings rather than on the communities. Does that answer your point, Paul? Yep. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Councillor Lennon, I see you're online again. Or you were a minute ago. Greg, Chairman, apologies. My connection is absolutely shocking today. So please accept my apology. I need to keep my camera off so I don't. Can you hear me? Yeah, can Greg? Can you hear you me, Chair? I can, I can, Paul, hey, Greg, rather, and uh, yep. your apologies. I'll come back. Alan, I think he's dropped off again. Maybe take Councillor McPake and then again can come back in. Thank you. Olivia. Councillor McPake, Michael. Thanks, Chair. Now, Chair, I did make a declaration of interest at the start of the meeting, and I've clarified with uh, the committee, the clerk, that my, my uh, when I read it again, the decision I was making a uh, declaration on was actually a decision that was already taken in August, so I've no need to declare an interest. I would just like to, uh, again, very, very good news stories, 2.2.4.1, where the, which we're going to speak about the we have been over two point four point one by the way. I'm a wee buyer. Oh dear. The green accelerator. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. The green growth accelerator. Now, I had the pleasure of being at Strathclyde Park today. There's a lot of work under has been undertaken already, and this is another fantastic news story for North Lanarkshire Council. Uh, we are marching ahead. We opened the new um, rainbow uh, outdoor play, uh, facility this morning. So that you know, again, it's we've got one hundred and twenty thousand pound here for a feasibility study towards the cost of developing the Pathfinder project. So another another great feather in the cap for North Lancashire Council. Hopefully, I just hope that all this is going to be successful because it it means it leads to much bigger and much better things in the future. So thanks, Chair. Thank you, Michael, for your contribution. Yeah. Thank you. Very positive. Um, Councillor Lennon, Greg. Thanks very much. I'm having internet difficulties today, as you can imagine. I've, I think I've signed on about six times in this meeting. It's, it's quite frustrating, Greg, at times, yes. Oh, it's ridiculous, Chair. Following on to, obviously, the report for the officers, I'm curious, Chair, in relation to the levelling up funding that's been proposed here. Obviously, it's great to hear that other areas of the authority are currently coming in line to try and, obviously, boost the areas and the social demographic, or the social economics of the areas and various other things. But I'm always at a loss, Chair, when I sit at these meetings because it seems to be a recurring pattern that appears that the Northern Corridor is continuously left out of any sort of future plan. So my question to officers is, is within the levelling up funding and within any other potential funding, what plans do we have in place just now in relation to looking at the Northern Corridor and significant funding coming to the area? 
Pam, uh, Pam, David, are you able to respond? So I, th I think the in the report itself, um, you know, that there's a, a I think we've highlighted in terms of the vacant derelict land fund and the, the, the investment that goes in. Um, you know, through, through fusion, there's obviously significant investment in in uh, the Gart Coast area. I think there's, um, we've, and we've also, um, as you know, in terms of the uh, the the the, the, the uh, schools for Gart Coast as well. That's that's um, I think one of the, uh, the the top priorities. So the, this this report is obviously highlighting external funding um, opportunities, and you know, we we very much have to be um, guided or whatever by the Criteria and the opportunities um, that, that are available to meet the criteria and the, the time scales. So, uh, these um, areas that have been identified are the were, were the projects that we we felt would have the you know meet the criteria um, in terms of the levelling up uh, agenda and the, the, the specific criteria, um, and obviously are capable of being delivered uh, within the the time scale that the, any funding that if we were successful has to be spent within. So. Uh, while obviously looking at all, all options across uh, the area, uh, these were the areas that we felt most uh, um, best fit, fit the criteria um, and, as I say, can, can be delivered um, within the, the time scale. But I say the, the report is not intended to be a, a comprehensive overview of all investment uh, across uh, across communities in North Lanarkshire. It is just highlighting um, these specific funding streams so that there is other activity. Greg, are you happy with that? Or do you want Chair, to... just a quick supplementary, and it's more of a point. I think uh -huh. that, again, the recognition that the authority is making to the Northern Corridor is quite incredulous. Chair, to be perfectly frank, we've got a, ex sort of a, a population growth that's that's quite exponential. And I think that the position here is, as we're seeing continuously, especially the residents in the Northern Corridor, a lack of willingness to make sure that appropriate investment and in infrastructure is taking place. Although Pam highlights that gap cost interchange is, is a significant area, but that brings no yeah. community benefits, private development for commercial work. So, so again, as great as that is for fusion assets, point being is it's no creating jobs, it's no creating opportunity. And the people that tend to live within the Northern Corridor, Again, the, the, the experience that I've had, I'm not looking for that localised job. They're all working in Glasgow and elsewhere. So, again, we have to come back to the point about infrastructure. Thank you, Chair. Uh, right. Well, Greg, your point's noted. I'll, we'll come back to you or I'll come back to you out with us. We can have a chat. I'll give you that assurance. OK. Colleagues, we have to uh, note the recommendations in page 61 and proceed. Thank you. Can we move on to item 7, which I understand... Hello. Yes, thank, okay. thanks, Convener, uh, and uh, hello, everyone. So this report about the Local Employability Partnership uh, describes, uh, well, within it, we're proposing uh, to allow the Local Employability Partnership, the membership and that's outlined at, the current membership's outlined at the uh, Appendix 1, to deal with some specific funding that's coming from the Scottish Government in 2020. 2022-2023 and, is, and is referred to as no one left behind phase two funding. Uh, we don't know exactly how much money that will, that will be, but we expect it to be somewhere between 800,000 and 1.3 million pounds. Uh, and the proposal within the report is that we set up a specific grants programme to deal with that funding. And we do that before a the, the money comes in April because we would like to to get that program kicked off in April uh, immediately, uh, so that there's no hiatus and and delay in getting provision on the ground. Uh, I suppose it's important to point out that uh, the grants program we think has got a number of advantages. Uh, it would be complemented by a, a national procurement framework. But the big advantage of a grant programme for us locally, we believe, is that it would allow community groups within North Lanarkshire, local groups, to apply for money. And we know that there are lots of smaller groups who maybe don't have the capacity to, to deal with large contracts, but they can provide really good local employability provision, whether that's very early stuff with a uh, people who are just about uh, thinking about getting a job or whether it's further on. We know that there's good good local groups available and this would allow this would bring them into that, that provision. And the other thing I want to point out is that 
and, and I think it's mentioned at 2.5, is that this approach only applies to this specific amount of funding coming from the Scottish Government. It doesn't apply to other funding that comes to North Lancashire Council, which we deal with as ourselves. But the, the one of the one of the conditions of this funding is that the local employability partnership gets gets a say in how it's uh, dispersed. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um, does it, colleagues, does anyone have any comments or questions or observations on what you've heard? No, Paul, I think you've got a... Uh, Councillor Damasio. Paul. Uh, I, I was just to say uh, briefly to, to thank Paul uh, and the team again uh, for the hard work they're doing in this area. It's a very important area, area thank in terms you, of employability, you. particularly... Promoted. At the moment, as we came out of COVID, um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's what what's been approved seems to be. Uh, uh, Paul and the team. Approach. Thank you, uh, Paul and the team do an excellent job. Thank you, colleagues. Are we happy to accept uh, recommendations of page seventy one? Yes. Thank you. Can we move us on to item eight? Which I understand, Paul, it's you again. Yes, thanks, convener. Uh, so, th this report uh, is to approve proposals for three point two million pounds that has come from the Scottish government for this financial year to support uh, the young persons guarantee, which is all about getting sixteen to twenty four year olds into work, uh, into education, or into training. Uh, it's very welcome funding, of course, and it comes on the back of 2.1 million that arrived at the start of 20, the calendar year 2021. So, uh, the, the the slight limitation to the funding, though, is that it needs to be all committed before the end of this financial year. So we've got basically four months to to spend an awful lot of money or commit an awful lot of money, and there's there's only various ways we can we can do that. Therefore, we've come up with a uh, five. A proposals to try and use use that funding because we don't want to be handing any of it back to the the government. The first uh, and th these proposals are outlined at two point four. The first of these is to enhance and support our own council modern apprenticeship program with seventy two places uh, this year. Uh, last year, the last financial year, the council didn't take on any modern apprentices for for good reason. You know that we were in the middle of lockdowns and whatever else. So it would it would get that modern apprenticeship program back back in play, uh, and we know how important that is for the future of the local authority as well as other employers. The second uh, proposal is to support the private sector in North Lanarkshire uh, with up to a million pounds to support. Our, Around 200 jobs for 16 to 24 year olds, and we would pay 50% of their their salary for for 12 months at either the national minimum wage or the real living wage. Uh, the third proposal was to enhance support for Kickstart, which is a Department of Work and Pensions program, which offers six months a uh, work experience to young people, and we would offer another six months on the back of that. The fourth is to support our colleagues in the voluntary sector. In North Lanarkshire and, and support them with up to 50 jobs for 16 to 24 year olds in that sector for up to 12 months, and we think that would be really attractive to them. We know how how uh, how much work they do uh, these days and and did during COVID, and and we think this we we know from speaking to them there's there's an appetite to recruit young people into that sector, and the final uh, proposal that that makes up the kind of cocktail of funding would be for our youth employment hub staff to be funded from this this funding for this a uh, financial year and the important part of that for for us in employability is that they deal with young people who really aren't ready for a job yet they are they're a bit further away and have other issues that need dealt with before we can get them into the job market and i think uh, i think you might Councillor Damasio was maybe referring to it in the last report, but the labour market has completely changed at the moment. You know, employers, I'm sure you know, are looking for employees and taking people on left, right, and centre. Our, cons our concern, therefore, has to be as, as as well as making sure those people are supported into work is that those who aren't getting a job at the moment, there's obviously a real issue. So we need to keep support going to them. Uh, So in, in total, that would provide jobs 
for 342 16 to 24 year olds from this current tranche of funding with another 365 sup supported into work from the previous tranche which would give us 707 young people into work if we spend all the money effectively and get all the numbers we we're targeting thank you thank you paul for that comprehensive update um councillor brand mcveigh heather Thanks, convener. Um, just want to say what an excellent report. Um, building on phenomenal practice, um, North Lanarkshire has always, always been ahead of the curve in engaging uh, young people in employment. I'm particularly pleased to see that there's not a one-size-fits-all approach here. There's a real diverse uh, and engaging uh, approach cross-sectorally and young people with different types uh, of, of needs. Uh, as well, which I think really builds on the, the understanding and practice that we have uh, available uh, in, in North Lanarkshire. So no question from me, just um, a vote of thanks um, to see this going forward and some wonderful opportunities for young people in North Lanarkshire in the very near future. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. Your kind comments are noted. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Demasio, Paul. Thank you, Chair. Uh, similar to uh, Councillor Brandon McVeigh, uh, welcome the, the strategy as, out, as outlined from the paper, uh, and th thank the thank the team again for all the hard work. Particularly as uh, you know, much of the funds received was received mid financial year, so I'm, I'm delighted that we've managed to uh, get this strategy implemented and in place so that North Lanarkshire doesn't lose that funding and we use it this financial year. So thanks again for your work. Thank you, Paul. Your kind comments are noted. Your positive sentiments are noted. Colleagues, are we happy to accept the recommendation on page 79? Thank you. Can we move on to item 9, please? And understand when. Thanks, Convener. Um, um, item 9 is the Muir Street Contract Award Report. Um, the, the, the committee will remember at the, the August um, committee that there was a request for an update on the outcome of the Mushi Award. Um, but given the time it's taken to, to finalise the, the full business case and to take our time around the evaluation of the, the, the contract, we're actually seeking approval today of that contract award. I'm very pleased to announce today that we've actually secured the full business case from the Glasgow City Region. It came through this week, so I'm, I'm I'm very pleased to be able to share that with you. Um, and with that, that 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 kind of approval in place, we're now looking to award the contract to Balfour BT under the SCAPE um, Civil Engineering Infrastructure Framework. This, if we seek, if we get that 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 approval today, that allows the works to um, commence in January 22. So so very imminent. Um, and get the, get the work started on site, which we've been kind of waiting for a long time for this project. It's been very complex and there's been various issues um, that, that we've needed to resolve in terms of the sort of detailed design. So really pleased that we've got to this point. There's been a lot of work involved in getting to this stage. So it would start in January 22 and the anticipated completion date is early um, July next year. The, the report sets out the, the kind of approved procurement route and um, it's very much been assessed to offer um, delivery benefits and, and minimise the risk to um, the, the contract and, and the works, particularly with the, the dependency with the Scott Rail works at the station, which you'll see if you if you go to Motherwell at the moment and you see the station, you can see significant works now taking place um, with um, their sort of phase three of works, which is the sort of retaining wall, which is the phase that we can then um, continue our works and um, once that's complete. Um, so the tender has been evaluated um, really robustly. We've crossed all the the, the, the T's and, and, and dotted the I's. It does represent value for money for the council. The sourcing methodology and the report itself sets out um, a number of benefits that the, the procurement approach and and um, the, the framework offers um, the council. But just to highlight that we, we do have an integrated um, program with um, the Balfour BT Works at, the, at um, station. The, the contracts will complete together. So we've got this agreement in place that there'll be a finish finish approach. Um, so both contracts will finish in early July. Um, it minimises the disruption to the town centre. Um, as I say, we get this finished product for both town centre users and, and rail um, station users. Um, and it really does um, minimise the risk. Um, Balfour BT know the site well and they know what the partners' um, aspirations are for, for both um, parts of the project in terms of that interchange. Um, so with, with that, um, um, 
full business case approval, we, we now have um, the funding approved, if you like, for the project. So the costs for this particular contract can be met um, through the approved budget as part of the, the Glasgow City Region City Deal Programme. And that's really all I want to kind of cover off um, today, but I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Lindsay. Colleagues, any comments, questions, observations? Councillor Damasio, Paul. Just a, a brief comment again. Obviously, the committee's in sight of this on a, an ongoing ba basis uh, uh, throughout the process and delighted to see it uh, getting over the line, so to speak. Um, and delighted to see, you know, the, the contractor concerned paying the loving wage and the, the uh, signed up to the, the Scottish business pledge. So, no, welcome this. Thank you, Thank you Paul. Thank you. Thank you, Lindsay, again. Colleagues, are we then happy to accept the uh, recommendation? Thank you. Can I move us on to item 10, which David, I believe, you're going to take us through the salient points. Thanks, Convener. Um, so this is the Fusion Assets Report, um, the one we normally bring uh, to committee every, every six months, and it'll provide an operational update for quarter one and two of 21-22. And also a six month for financial performance update um, between January and June 2022. So, in terms of operational performance, that's mainly covered uh, within Appendix 1. Um, and it's basically we're still on course to meet or surpass all of our uh, annual targets for this year. I think what's probably more important is when you, you recognise the end column there, the cumulative total basically saying that, you know, Fusion Assets have now been operational for 10 years, you know, in terms of actually. In business and industry. Um, so when you look at that, you know, over the last 10 years, we've supported the development of eight industrial sites, supported 34 businesses to set up uh, or expand within North Lanarkshire, created 416 jobs, and supported uh, just under £30 million investment on industrial businesses sites, which are actually complete now. So this doesn't include the ones which have just been enabled. <clears throat> So, in terms of financial performance, that's outlined in 2.2. Uh, it's a very similar position to what was reported six months ago. Slight changes, uh, mostly based upon land value. Um, but um, if you look at 2.2, it highlights that the company does have a very good asset liability uh, rating of 1.93, which basically puts it, the company in a very good financial position. So, Going on to the key achievements for this year, which are outlined in uh, 2.3 for quarter one and two. So this includes uh, starting works on site uh, on the two remaining units at phase one of Gart Kosh, uh, which will provide just over 40,000 square foot um, of industrial estate. Uh, and that's meant to be completed by the end of the calendar year. And we now have Fusion have full occupancy upon all their existing property portfolio as well, which is, again, really good news in terms of bringing in revenue and, and meeting the, 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 the um, uh, returns they need to be able to sell these developments on. Thank you. Happy to take any questions. Thank you, David, for that. Councillor McPake, Michael. Yes, thanks, Chair. Um, David, another very good report. Um, in 5.1, um, we're talking there about £5.5 .5 million pounds investment made within the Gap Caution Industrial Park. This yep. is fantastic. Uh, I'd like to ask you the last time, there are, are certainly more we can do over there. And I think you said it's got to be done in a phased uh, manner rather than just doing it all at once. Is there any further plans to bring the phases forward at any time? Yep, time? yep. So, basically, um, so in terms of the phases, phase, this is phase one, just about to be completed. Phase two has had all the enabling works uh, completed on the ground. Uh, for that, so um, Fusion Assets are now actively um, seeking um, a, an equity joint bench partnership uh, to take that forward, and we have just given the second phase um, of BDLF award for phase three and four uh, within the park. So, in essence, this will allow Fusion Assets to buy the, those sites and also to undertake the enabling works on that. So, I think they see this as a very good location, you know, in terms of business business, you know, in that kind of M8 to M8 corridor. Um, so this is certainly one of the ones they want to you know, focus on that kind of an enabling investment in. So overall, I think it's about 260,000 square foot that would be planned in terms of industrial development here. So it's uh, very good news, I think. 
Thank you very much for that, David. Thanks. Thank you. No other comments, colleagues? You have to accept the recommendation on page 93. Thank you. Greg. Thanks. Thanks it's just a, a brief question for David. David, in relation to the rest of the site, does it, the council have any plans in relation to the development of the further aspects of the site? Or is it just looking for a, a, a sort of business retail park? I, I think, you know, I mean, obviously it's, it's um, Scottish Enterprise that, that um, hold the, the land ownership of it. So they actually control, you know, the, the planning and management of it. But I think there was, I'm, I'm not sure, Pam, whether you can comment on additional interest that's been in the other part of the site yet. Yeah, I mean, we, the, there has been a, a significant um, interest that, that Scottish Enterprise have uh, indicated to us, and um, we we hope that that will be getting brought forward soon um, through the planning process. So uh, I don't think we're, we're probably um, able to say, say too much more at this stage, but um, if, if it does, um, and as, as far as we know, it is, uh, it is a, an advanced stage, um, that then it would be a major a investment um, for for North Lanarkshire and, and a major opportunity. So hopefully, um, we'll be able to share that, or, or that will be coming out um, uh, to members very very soon. Um, but yeah, see that that could be a, a, an exciting opportunity. Greg, does that answer your point? Just a quick supplementary, Chair. It's just for reassurance for the officers that dialogue is continuing with Scottish Enterprise, and we're making sure that obviously this dialogue is going to continue into the future for the potential use of the site. Noted. Colleagues, thank you for that. Uh, we'll accept the recommendation, I assume, on page 93. Thank you. Can we go on to item 11? Roots to work, uh, Paul. Okay, thanks, Convener. So this is quite similar to the previous report. This is the six monthly update to committee on a uh, routes to works performance and finance. At a 2.2 in the report, it gives some of the, the highlights that have been picked out in, in terms of that reporting period. The reporting period is January 2021 till June 2021. Uh, in terms of the performance, there was nothing I, I was going to highlight. A, it was a difficult period. Obviously, there was a. I think there was a lot. One of the many lockdowns was the January February a time, and they're only now getting back to face to face a, meetings with with some clients. A, in terms of the the finance, a, our colleagues in a, finance haven't picked up anything that that would be of concern, and, and the organisation remains a, robust. Financially, but there is a slight difference to this report, and that uh, there's an addition to it, which is a uh, for committee's approval, and that is a change to the article articles of association for the organisation, uh, and uh, the report's looking for the, the committee's approval for the head of legal and democratic services to sign that, uh, sign that resolution for that change. The reason the changes are are within here is because. They, they realised during the first lockdown that their articles of association weren't fit for purpose in terms of meeting remotely and therefore had to be changed. And it's taken this long for those changes to be done with the legal teams involved and then brought to committee. And the process of tidying that up, that part of the articles of association up, they've, they've tidied up a few other things about in relation to the membership of category, category B directors, which is non-council non directors as well as uh, the retirement of directors. So there's, there's minor minor tweaks to the Articles of Association, but the, the key change is that the board can now meet remotely, uh, legally, uh, you know, in, in terms of, uh, in case there's any other lockdowns or whatever. And, and, and for, so, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Any comments or observations, colleagues? Are we happy to accept a recommendation on page 107? Agreed. Thank you very much. Now, before you go, colleagues, uh, I'm behalf of the Vice Convener and myself, I'd like to thank the, the staff of Enterprise for doing the sterling work. We've had a series of positive reports today, and we're on a good journey. We're in a good place. And as Joe Biden said some time ago, fear never builds the future, but hope does. And we are certainly no fear. Colin, you got one point before you go. Just a point.
but I, I was wanting to quickly ask Andrew because I'm not working from home or from the office at the moment and I don't have access to a shredder. There's nothing in these papers that needs to be kept private. I can just drop them in the recycling in the, uh, the area I'm in. Is that okay? That, that's correct. All the papers are in the public domain. Okay, I just wanted to check that before I did it. It's just I'm unable to access uh, a shredder at the, the current time. Thank you. Thanks, Colin. Have a good day. And um, could I ask the officers to stay on the line, please? And I bid the rest of you farewell.